here today organizing this event today because this coming weekend Saudi Arabia is due to host the G20 summit. Um, and while there are plenty of questions we could ask about the legitimacy of this particular club of nations that have appointed themselves guardians of global economic stability, um, the questions of legitimacy that we're really interested in today are about how the G20 presidency and the summit are offering an international platform, one which the Saudi Arabian authorities are determined to use as a public relations exercise, both to deflect criticism and shore up international support. Um, so for the Saudi government, this is an opportunity to promote themselves as modernizers, as reformers, something which has been a renewed focus since Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman rose to prominence in 2015. Um, and this evening, we really want to probe that rhetoric of reform um, and also how and why the UK government conspires to support it. Um, so on the one hand, we have a summit advertising itself with a focus on empowering people and creating the conditions in which all people can live, work and thrive. Um, but on the other, Saudi authorities are denying such conditions to many of their own people and those who demand them are facing persecution, torture and imprisonment. Um, and we have a crown prince who was lauded for lifting the ban on women driving in 2018. Um, but what of the women who had campaigned so long at such great personal risk for these very rights? Um, in the days before that announcement, many prominent activists who had campaigned both for the right to drive and an end to the male guardian guardianship system uh, were arrested and many of them remain in prison today and have experienced abuse and torture. So their only crime was to be an activist and campaigning for the very measures that the regime is trying to get international credit for implementing. And if we're celebrating empowering people, it's these voices that we must listen to and support. Um, so we're really glad that one of our panelists today is going to be Safa Al Ahmed, journalist, filmmaker, and now acting director of Al Kist, um, an independent organization working to defend human rights in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think later on, Seth is going to tell us more about that, that clampdown and about activism inside and outside Saudi Arabia and explore patriarchy and theocracy in both Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, we'll also be asking, what does this all have to do with the UK? Um, and this particular narrative of reform is one that suits the UK authorities too, which the UK government is very happy to conspire in perpetuating. Um, so in February 20, 2018, just before UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson welcomed the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to the UK, he published an article in the Times newspaper, which was entitled, Saudi reformer Mohammed bin Salman deserves our support. Um, and in this he claimed, and I'm, I'm just quoting him briefly, sorry. Um, in the eight months since Mohammed bin Salman became Crown Prince, Saudi Arabia has introduced exactly the kind of reforms that we have always advocated. Um, and he added, change does not come easily in Saudi Arabia. In a matter of few months, genuine reform has taken place after decades of stasis. Um, and I think Boris Johnson's claim was that somehow through the benevolent actions of this prince and with the urging of the progressive UK government, reforms that had apparently previously been impossible in a conservative country were suddenly coming one after the other. Um, so what does this tell us about the patriarchal and neo-colonial attitudes of the UK's leaders, this denial of agency and this patronizing bestowal of progress? And what a cynical conspiracy at a time when activists and human rights advocates were making clear that the situation had deteriorated in so many ways that the crackdown on dissent was intensifying. Um, yet the UK government remains happy to boost those who try and silence and imprison those people. So it of course uh, suits the UK government to maintain these objectionable myths that change comes from above and that the Saudi Arabian authorities are patiently trying to coax change in a place where it apparently doesn't come easily. And I think this has something to do with the fact that Saudi Arabia is the biggest buyer of UK arms in the world and has been a major customer since the 1960s. 
The UK government is intimately involved in these arms deals and has helped Saudi authorities maintain power and control for decades. Um, so to explore this, we're also delighted to be joined by academic and writer Dr. David Waring, who later on is going to help us understand more about the history and nature of this relationship, who wins and loses and why it continues. Um, and lastly, the UK government has certainly done all of it can to keep these arms sales flowing. And it is no coincidence that Boris Johnson's praise for the Crown Prince came at the same time as the two governments were signing a memorandum of understanding in order for Saudi Arabia to buy a further 48 Eurofighter typhoons from the UK. Praising reform while seeking to supply more of the very same aircraft that were being used and are still being used by the Saudi forces in bombing attacks on Yemen. A Saudi-led coalition launched its first bombing raids in Yemen in March 2015, uh, and there was evidence of violations of international humanitarian law since the very first day of those attacks. Um, since then, thousands of people have been killed directly in the bombing, many of which have hit civilian infrastructure, many of those attacks have hit civilian infrastructure, further violations of international humanitarian law. Um, this is also a war where starvation has been used as a weapon and the means of life and the means of saving life have been systematically targeted. Millions of people are facing starvation and disease as a result of these strategies. Um, and it's a war where UK weapons are playing a central role, where UK made warplanes are dropping UK made bombs, firing UK made missiles, where the planes are maintained and serviced by UK personnel. Um, with those weapon supplies promoted by the government. Uh, CAT estimates that more than £15 billion pounds of weapons have been supplied by the UK since the start of the war. Um, so these sales continue despite the fact they are in clear violation of UK and international rules on arms sales. Uh, at Campaign Against Arms Trade, we've been challenging those sales in the courts for more than four years now. Last year, um, the Court of Appeal judged that the government's licensing process was irrational and therefore unlawful, and new sales at least were put on hold. Um, but the government is fighting us every step of the way in order to keep those sales flowing, um, has resumed new arms sales. So just last month, we were forced to launch a second legal challenge. And once again, we're told that these arms sales are vital to maintain influence. Um, former Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt wrote an opinion piece where he claimed that ending UK arms sales for use in Yemen would be morally bankrupt, arguing if we stopped those sales that we would surrender our influence and make ourselves irrelevant into the course of events. Um, but it's clear that UK arms sales are facilitating this war, not moderating it. And there's no evidence that this strategic relationship has stopped violations or is hastening the end of the conflict. Um, those violations have continued and continue today. And in fact, the UK government has blocked them from being properly investigated. So it seems to us that the continued supply of arms is also helping by the UK government's willingness to conspire with the authorities that are bombing and imprisoning and abusing and sidelining those who are really driving reform and demanding accountability. So we hope that today will go a little way to help challenge that conspiracy, this rhetoric of reform and which stories are being heard and which, voice, which voices are being heard. Um, and we're going to start tonight by hearing from one of the organisations that are at the forefront of demanding accountability in Yemen. Martina um, is an independent Yemeni organisation which advocates for human rights through documenting human rights violations, providing legal support to victims, lobbying, as well as raising awareness and building capacity in human rights. They do really vital, really, really important work. Um, and Osama is the Director of Media Communications and Advocacy at Martina um, and previously led their research, um, speaking to us today from Sana in Yemen. Um, Osama, thank you so much for being here. Um, over to you. 